Be a fool, be wise. Do not just throw words left, right, and center without thinking about what you're saying, without focusing on what you're saying, without weighing what you are about to say. You need to be wise. You need to be wise. Time is to do with the temporal life. Faith is to do with the eternal life. Before I continue, is it hot in the church? No? Must be me then. <laughs> right. All right. You see, in the midst of seriousness, it doesn't hurt to say to be a little bit humorous. <laughs> there you go. Now, how can I elevate myself above the time? When I turn to the crucified Messiah, how can I elevate myself and be above the time when I turn to the crucified Jesus Christ of Nazareth? I'll give you this from the Holy Bible. The two thieves that were crucified on either side of the Lord Jesus. How come one of them was saved, the other was lost? What happened to this man who was saved by the Lord Jesus? What happened? Four things. You know, this guy was 100% going to hell. 100, no chance. He done everything wrong under the sun. He was a murderer, he was a thief, he was everything, everything bad you could think of. And he's crucified now, he's nailed on the cross, meaning he can't go back and try to change his lifestyle. Too late, he's about to die. Biologically, physically, he's about to die. The last seconds of his life are ticking away right before his very eyes while he is hanged on the cross. But four things saved this man. Four things made this murderer, this thief, this bad citizen to redeem the time for the days are evil. Four things. Number one, when he heard the Lord Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. Number two, fear of the Lord. Number three, Confession of guilt. Number four, confession of the perfection of Christ. Number one, when he heard the Lord Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. Now, I'm sure the word would, would have gone around and this man would have heard there is this great teacher and preacher and great prophet and great man of God that has come and... and wiped the entire Israelite nation, you know, with his absolute, you know, powerful teaching and wondrous doings. So he's heard that he is claiming to be the son of God, meaning he's coming from above. So he would have wondered, who is his God, who is his father? Where is his father? So when he heard the Lord on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, he looked in the crowd, because normally, when you call someone's name, you definitely look at them, don't you? You know? When you say, huh? <laughs> when you say, George, you look at George. You don't look at someone else, you look at George. So when he said, Father, this thief said, oh, perfect. I'm gonna find out where is his dad. So he looked in the crowds, Nobody put their hand up. Nobody said, yes, son. He said, oh, he's definitely not here. So he turns to the Lord Jesus and sees him looking up to heaven and saying, Father. He said, whoa. Looks like this man is the real deal. Looks like this man is, it is he who claims to be. He is the son of God. And, and God is his dad. 
because when he called daddy, he looked up in heaven. So daddy must be in heaven and the only one who art in heaven is God. So he is the son of God. I need to redeem the time because the days are evil and the only way I will redeem all the time I've lost in lust, in sin, in doing everything evil under the sun. The only way I will redeem this time is when I cling onto this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Looks like he has come from heaven and his dad is God who art in heaven. When he looked at Jesus saying, Daddy, straight away he believed. When he believed, what did we say faith is? Eternal life. Time, temporal life. When he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what happened when you have faith in the Lord, something will enter your life called fear of the Lord. Number two, he had the fear of the Lord. How do we know he had the fear of the Lord? By turning to his friend. Because the other guy was actually telling Jesus off. The other person was ridiculing the Lord Jesus. They are friends for God knows how many years. So this man who believed in the Lord had the fear of the Lord. He turned to his friend, he said, don't you fear God? Have you no fear of God? Excuse me? Look who's talking. <laughs> the one who killed people is talking about fearing God. Where were you, my dear friend, when you slashed someone's throat? Didn't you have the fear of the Lord then? No. Where were you when you stole things, when you destroyed things? You're talking about fearing God? He says, yes, because I believe Jesus Christ is the only way. Fearing the Lord means loving the Lord. I began to love the Lord Jesus. Now, since I began to love the Lord, I will tell my friend, have you no fear of God? How dare you talk to this holy man in such inappropriate way? How dare you? Wow, what a great man is. Before he was the same as his friend. My dear people, Jesus Christ changes people. Jesus Christ changes your way of thinking, your way of talking, your way of walking, your way of everything. He changes it. All you need to do is turn to the crucified Messiah and he will change you. All the foul language, he will turn it into praises. All the dark alleys will turn him into the light. Jesus is known to change. A Christian that has the fear of the Lord seeks forgiveness. A Christian that has the fear of the Lord seeks forgiveness. You will never, you will never, you will never ask the Lord to forgive you until you have the fear of the Lord in your heart. Because if you do not love him, you will never ask him to forgive you. And you wouldn't even care about asking him to forgive you. It is that love, that fear of the Lord. What is fear of the Lord? You see, it's not afraid of the Lord. I'm not afraid of him. I fear him. You see, afraid is, if I do something wrong, I'm afraid because he will chop my head and he'll throw me in hell. But fear of the Lord I do not want to do anything wrong. I am afraid of breaking his heart. He is too much love, not worthy to be broken. I fear hurting him. I don't want to make him sad. 
I don't want to upset him. I don't want to make him cry. I don't want to break his heart because he is love and I love him because he loved me from the very beginning. I will try to do everything possible through his grace not to break him or hurt him in any way. This is the fear of the Lord, i.e. I love the Lord Jesus. See, when you love the Lord Jesus, you will always seek his forgiveness. Lord, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I did this and I said this. I didn't want to. It is my human weakness. Please forgive me, Lord. You know that I love you. Like Simon, like Simon Peter. He said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? You see, do you love me? Do you fear me? Do you have the fear of the Lord in your heart? He said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know everything, Lord. I will always put you number one. And then me. You know that I love you, Lord. But I'm weak. When we fall into the wrong place, when we do the wrong thing, all we need to do, turn to the crucified Messiah. Don't run away, run to him. Don't run away from him. Run to him, my beloved, and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. You know that I love you, but I'm weak living in this weak flesh. I get tempted, I fall, I slip, I slide, I walk away. Please forgive me, daddy. And he will, and he will. When you have the fear of the Lord, the love of Christ in your heart, you will seek his forgiveness. And when you seek his forgiveness, then what do you do? You confess that you're guilty. <laughs> the confession of guilt. Number three, when we come and confess to the Lord Jesus that we've done this wrong and we've said this wrong and we shouldn't have and we are sorry for what we've done the Lord is faithful that he will forgive us our sins he is faithful and that's another topic he's faithful and number four when you confess that Christ is perfect and you're not when we confess the perfection of Christ and we are absolutely imperfect humans you are the perfect one Lord how did this when did this thief say or acknowledge or confess Christ's perfection when he said when he said to his friend don't you have the fear of the Lord of God don't you fear God he said, but this, referring to Jesus, he said, but this, but this, he has done nothing out of place. But this, everything he said, everything he's done is absolutely perfect. He said things in the perfect timing and he did things in the perfect timing. This is the perfect one. We are worthy of this being crucified and sentenced to death we deserve it because everything that we've done on earth was evil but this he's done nothing that is worthy of the cross he's done nothing that is worthy of the cross but this again In the Arabic language, it's called the demonstrative noun. Ism al-ishara. Demonstrative noun. But this, the only way you can say it is when you look at the person you mean. But this. Now, this guy is, is nailed on the cross. His hands, his feet are nailed. He can't move, neither his legs nor his hands. The only thing he can move is his head. So when he said, but this, he turned his face to the Lord Jesus and he faced him. 
the moment he turned his face to the Lord and said, but this, the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 45, 22 was fulfilled. What does Isaiah 45, 22 say? Look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Oh my goodness. What? Look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. When this thief looked at Jesus Christ by turning to the Lord, he was saved. For God promised in Isaiah 45, 22, whoever looks to me will be saved, for I am God and there is no other. So if he, anyone to come and say, this Jesus that was nailed on the cross is not God, then explain to me Isaiah 45, 22. He didn't say, look to me, for my, my dad is God. No, he said, for I am God, and there is no other. And there is no other. By looking at the Lord. Is that all it takes? Yes. Can you be saved easily? 100% yes. For as long as you live in the flesh, don't wait afterwards and start elaborating. Please don't. You haven't been to the other side. Why waste your time, precious time, talking about something you've never seen on the other side? You wanna be saved the best way, the easiest way, while in the flesh, my dear friend. Don't wait, while in the flesh. It's very easy. All you need to do is turn to the crucified Jesus and say, Lord, remember me in your second coming. What did the Lord Jesus say to this poor man? Truly I say to you, today you are with me in paradise. Not in my second coming, my dear friend. If you were gonna wait for my second coming, oh, it's been 2022 years. And counting today you will be with me in paradise when the Lord Jesus said to this man today you will be with me in paradise every single second minute hour day week month year this man lost in sin in evilness every single moment was redeemed by the Lord Jesus through the faith of this man in Christ was redeemed nothing is lost how many years have you lost in this world let Jesus redeem it for you give your life to the Lord Jesus and he will make sure nothing is gone in vain nothing so don't cry about the time that is gone by in absolute vanity focus on Christ and turn to him and look at the crucified for the crucified Messiah is my glory I boost in no one but Jesus Christ being crucified this is the glory of me Christ crucified Because St. Paul says also in his epistle to the Romans 14, 8, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to Him. So it's beside the point whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Make sure you make sure that happens in your life. And how do you make sure that you belong to the Lord? Give Him everything. Give Him your life. Surrender everything to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, you take over. You look after me my family, my loved ones, the entire people that are in my life whom you have 
given me and showed me. I surrender everything in your capable hands. I surrender everything. And then stop worrying. Stop pulling your hair out and say, my sister is not talking to me. My brother is not calling me. My wife has given me hell. My husband is not listening to me. No, the moment you give everything to the Lord, give it and walk in confidence that Christ has taken it on board. And now he is the responsible one for you and for everyone whom you have entrusted him with. Leave it to him. Leave it to him. Leave it to him, my beloved. Verse 70, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of, of the Lord is. Wow. Therefore, do not be unwise. Unwise, fools. In other words, ignorance. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Unwise or fools. The word fools is mentioned in the New Testament three times. Foolish fools is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Very quickly. Number one, in Luke 12, 20, the rich man. This rich man sat one night and he said, my fields have given me, you know, produce plentifully. There's plenty of it. So what do I do? Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, bring down some of these barns, I'm gonna extend them and I'll build more new barns and then I'll fill them with all the produce the land has given me. And then I'll say to myself, self, enjoy. You've got plenty of wealth that will last you for many, 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 many years to come. Enjoy it. God came to him that night and he said, you fool. Your life will be taken away from you this very night. All this. What for? Yes, the land gave you plenty of produce. Correct. Yes, this produce will last you for many, many, many years to come. Correct. But my dear friend, are you going to live these many, many years? No guarantee, you fool. No guarantee. What are you planning? What are you doing? Wake up. Wake up. Please wake up. Second time. Luke 24:13. Those two friends were walking to Amaus. 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 That's the proper pronunciation, Amaus. Those two friends that were walking, one of them happened to be, tradition say that it was Saint Luke. The one that's, whose name was not mentioned is Saint Luke. They were walking. And then the Lord Jesus was walking behind them and got to them. And he saw them talking and troubled and, you know, they were in a lot of turmoil. He said, what's going on? He said, they said to him, oh, it looks like you're a stranger. You have no idea what happened in the last few days in Jerusalem. He said, what? He said, oh, this Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this holy man of God, you know, he came and he said, I am it. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I'm the Redeemer. I'm God revealed in the flesh. We followed him for three years and a bit. And now they just crucified him and they put him in the tomb. And it looks like it's a hoax. We were lied to. He was a great manipulator and a deceiver. And now we're confused. We're lost. We're destroyed. So we said, let's go back to our town. This is enough embarrassment already. We've had enough of this nonsense. Even some of the women who accompanied us, they went to the tomb and they came back and they said, they saw angels and the angels said to them, why are you seeking the, the living among the dead? He is alive, he's risen. But we didn't believe. So the Lord said, 
you foolish ones, foolish, unwise. I just told you, you fools, a few days ago, I'll be handed over to authorities, I'll be crucified, I will be put in the tomb, I'll rise on the third day and I will see you again. How could you forget so quickly and so easily? Fools. Third one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 36. St. Paul says, you fool. <laughs> and 37 he says, look at this, I'll read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 36. Foolish one, what you saw is not made alive unless it dies. Verse 37, and what you saw, you do not saw that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. What is St. Paul saying? You fool, foolish one. What you saw will not live unless it dies first. If, we, if people say, I'm not going to believe in God unless I understand. See, some people, they want to believe in God when they get it in their head. <laughs> Sorry, doesn't work that way. If everything is logic, and we've got a problem here. The, the grain of wheat, for as long as it's outside, it's dead. As long as it's outside, it's dead. Now, how do you know if this thing is dead or, or alive? Movement. Movement is the sign of life. When there is no movement, it's a sign of death. If someone is asleep, if I'm asleep, and I'm not snoring, I'm not moving, I'm not making no sound, no noise, it's like I'm as if I'm dead. But the moment I move, oh, he's still alive. So movement is the sign of life. When you look at the grain of wheat, there is no sign of life because there is no movement in this grain. Now, how can your intellect accept this and believe in this, that unless you bury this grain of wheat, unless you kill it, it will never live? The moment you bury it, then it becomes alive. Now that's illogical, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. What are you saying? You need to bury something for it to be alive? He said, yes, if you don't bury it, it's, not, it's, it's dead. The moment you bury it, it's alive. It's the other way around. Then why don't you believe that when we bury our loved one, now they are alive, not while they were on earth? You see, while on earth, we are that grain of wheat, we're dead. The moment we're buried, then we are truly alive. As one church father said, we are walking corpses. <laughs> Time is ticking. We're all dead. We are walking dead people. Dead people walking. But the moment we are buried, we become alive, just like that grain of wheat. As long as it stays outside, it's dead. The moment you put it underground and all that soil on top of it, now it's alive. But you see, when you plant that seed, and when you bury that seed, you get a much greater produce than one seed. You plant one, you get 40. But not only 40 seeds, you get a stump, and you got a flower, and you get a head as well. So what you planted is not what you're gonna get. What you're gonna get is much greater than what you planted initially. So he's in 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul says, foolish one, you realize that the grain of wheat, until it's dead, then it's alive. Why can't you believe until you are buried, then you are living? Why can't you believe it? Why when we bury someone, we mourn for them for years and years, especially Middle Eastern culture? Oh my, my, my. Middle Eastern, it's forever. Oh, you need to learn from the Aussies. 
Kalaniumite. The Aussies, they buried their loved one. They'll go back. Cheese, bro. Yeah, he was a great man, but it's a great wine as well. We don't sit fees crying, dressed up in black. I will never be happy again. Don't come ever and tell me, let's go to the wedding. I'm not going to no wedding. My loved one is dead. I am dead. I am dead. You're not. Wake up. If we believe in the Lord Jesus, then we are the children of the resurrection. We are the children of hope. See, Middle Eastern people were influenced by Middle Eastern cultures and religions, non-Christians. Christianity says, after the third day, the grave is empty. Christianity says, if you have Christ as Lord and Savior, then the tomb is empty. Do you cry for someone that is resurrected? Do you cry for someone that is the living Messiah? No. Do you mourn the living? No, you only mourn the dead. Then if you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, then there is no death. There is no death. In fact, the moment I am buried, then I can say I'm alive. For as long as I walk on earth, I'm dead. Why I'm dead? Because I won't tell you. <laughs> because I'll ask you this. Oh, sorry. When do we stop sinning? When we die? Absolutely. When we stop sinning? When we die. For as long as I'm in this flesh, my eyes are open, I can hear, I can see, I can smell, I can walk, I can touch, I am always susceptible to making mistakes. I see things, they make me fall. I hear things, they make me fall. I walk, they make me fall. I touch, they make me fall. For as long as I'm in the flesh, I am a sinner. And if, so, if anybody says that you are not a sinner, you are mistaken. For the Lord Jesus did not come to deprive you from your will. You see, the salvation of God to humanity does not mean that God took your will away from you because the will will always be with you because love, God will never take it away from you. And for as long as there is love, there is freedom. For, for there is freedom, there is choices. And as long as there are choices, there is the will. God will never take away the will from you. If he takes your will, he has to take your options, your freedom and love. You no longer his child, you're a slave. God did not come to redeem slaves. He came to redeem us and make us sons of God. Free. The son is free. The slave is not. So therefore, my beloveds, since I have the will, I can do things my way, not God's. When do I stop sinning? When do I stop using my will when I'm buried? When I die, then and then only I can say, I cannot sin anymore. For when you cannot sin anymore, you're living. <laughs> because what is the wage of sin? Death. The moment you stop sinning, you're living. Now it all depends whether you live in heaven or elsewhere, but you're living.